And today, the question of authenticity is all the more important because of the very high prices for works of art selling on the market. So your work could either be worth $5 million or worth zero. And the problem of authenticity is exacerbated by the fact that many of the specialists, the scholars in artists, are being sued by disgruntled collectors if they find out that the work they acquired is not the real deal. So scholars are going underground, they refuse to sign a paper stating that a work of art is authentic, and it's becoming very, very difficult. So my job is authenticating the work based on my experience and based on my eye, having a sense of whether or not this is really uh, the work by this particular artist. And even at this price level, between ten and $25,000, they're fakes on the market, amazingly enough. I'm going to give you an example. This is a work that I purchased in France about eight years ago. It was attributed to a French artist whose name is Georges saint -Lain. And an attribution means that they think it's by the artist, but they're not sure. And it was very frustrating for me because I wanted to be sure. And about six months ago, I took it off the wall, I put it on the floor of my apartment, and I took a microscope, uh, a magnifying glass, and I started looking at it. And all of a sudden, I discovered the initials of the artist in the corner there, GSL, and I knew it was Georges Saint-Lac. So for me, it was almost a confirmation that I knew that it was the artist, it's no longer attributed to, it's by Georges Saint-Lac, and now I could say, I authenticated, it is by the artist. So sometimes it's very difficult to know for sure if the artist is, uh, is the one who painted the work, but as a dealer, I stand behind the work that I sell, and if somebody comes back to me and says, it's not by the artist, I will reimburse them for the work of art. But this is part of my expertise, is knowing to be able to authenticate a work of art. Authenticity is the most important factor in determining value in a work of art. Quality of workmanship and details are also very important in establishing value in a work of art. Again, coming back to this work, you could see that the artist had acquired the technique, the detail in the thimble, in the thread, in the scissors here, the wonderful light hitting this copper urn, the detail of the flowers, this wonderful flow of fabric. All of this, all of the details that the artist is able to put in his painting, they emphasize the fact that this is a quality work of art. Condition also is a very important factor. Something that's in pristine condition, that's never been retouched, that's never been restored, will always command a premium in the art market. And sometimes condition is easy to tell. Sometimes if a leg has been broken off the table, you could say if it's glued. But sometimes condition is not obvious at all. And when you buy from a dealer, the dealer, if they're honest, will tell you whether or not a work has been restored, repainted, what the condition was. But anything that comes to the market that's intact, that's in pr pristine condition, always commands a premium on the art market. The period of a work of art and its rarity also commands a premium in the art market. I have a work here by an artist whose name is Bernier, Thomas Bernier. It's dated 1957. It was shown at 19. Salon des Artistes Français, which is a very prestigious salon in Paris, and I know this because the label on the back is still there. These are indications not only of provenance, but of authenticity, and the date of this painting is very important as well. You're not always lucky to be able to get the uh, a, something that's dated or know what the provenance is. I'll talk a little bit about provenance later on. But when you can, it's a very good indicator of when the work was done and the quality of the workmanship at that point in time. An object also that is new to the market, something that hasn't been seen by the public, also commands a premium. I bought, for example, a work by Edmond Peradon. He is a French artist who never had to sell his artwork during his lifetime. He came from a well-to-do family and he traveled with his family throughout France. And when he died, his whole studio was put on the market for sale. So this was coming, it was the primary market, that means it was coming straight from the studio into the market. 
and I bought two works of his. There is a catalogue raisonné, which is the definitive catalogue of all of the works of Peradon that came out when his studio was sold. And now that these works are getting onto the secondary market, they means they're being traded by collectors and dealers alike, the prices are starting to go up. So when I bought this, was, this was new to the market because it came from the studio. So these are works that command a premium in the secondary markets. Works by living artists are always more speculative than works by artists that are deceased. Artists that are deceased, their, their work of art, their output is being studied by scholars. The scholars say this period is better than another period, this work is better than another. They've been studied, uh, articles have been published about the artist, and there is an established price range for these artists. Contemporary artists, you don't know if they're going to burn out, you don't know if they're going to keep on producing quality work or if they're going to become more commercial. You don't know if the dealers are going to make them pump out 20, 30 works of art a month. So the, in all of this, the supply can order down the value of their works of art. So in general, it's better to buy the best quality work by a lesser known artist than poor quality by a well known artist because the quality will always retain its value. And in contemporary art especially, one has to be extremely careful because there is a tremendous amount of speculation. There is a tremendous amount of manipulation of the markets by dealers who hold vast inventories of these contemporary artists. And artists do need the time and the breathing room to develop their own style. They need to mature. And this could take months and years uh, over time. So you really have to give them the time to develop. So these are all very important factors in determining value in a work of art. I was asked by the editor of the Fine Art Connoisseur magazine to write an article about these lesser known master painters because he said, I want people, my readers to know that one does not have to be a millionaire to be able to put together a collection of quality works of art. And I wrote the article and he put a painting from my collection on the cover. And if you would like to have a copy of the article, it talks about the Women Affordable Art Collection, I would be more than happy to send it to you if you put your name on my email list too. And if you have any questions with regard to specific works of art or my putting together the collection, I would be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Yes. Carol, I wonder if I could ask a question. Um, what are your thoughts about valuation services? For example, Art Price has the, if you subscribe Art Price, you can send in a work with the data and a file of it, and they'll send you back some, usually three auction comps and a sense for what they think, the range of what they think the value is. What has been your experience, if any, with that, and what is your opinion? Well, the, when you uh, are getting an opinion about valuation from one of these art price or art net, you're only basing it on the works of art sold at auction. Yes. And you have to remember that over 60% of the works sold are sold privately. So you're getting a very skewed market. Whatever is being sold by a dealer, you're never going to know what the prices are. Also, it's not going to tell you the quality of the art. You could have a Picasso that sells for 50000 and you could have a Picasso selling for $5 million. And it all has to do with the quality of workmanship. These art sites are not giving you information about quality. Generally, they're not giving you information about condition. They're not also telling you whether or not it's been offered privately and it wasn't able to sell, therefore it's coming onto the public market. You have to know who the players are in the art market in order to know what, how, how to be able to price something. And they're always, uh, you know, it's also a question of, for example, at auction, when works sell at auction, sometimes the work of art will go for a much higher price for no other reason than a, a, a museum wants to acquire a work to fill a gap in its collection. So even if a work doesn't have an inherent value that's higher, that's more, more important, because a museum feels that it's important to have it as part of its collection, it will bid up the price of a work of art. So you really have to know all the elements at play, and all of these art sites are not going to be able to give you that. So when people come to me and say, oh, Carol, 
I saw this artist, but on the internet, his prices are two, three thousand, and you're asking eight thousand. I say, wait a second, did you look at the quality of what the work was? Did you see when it was done? Did you see, I mean, all of these things that I talked to you about what constitutes value in a work of art make a huge difference. And these are all qualitative, they're not quantitative. And one of my problems when I put together the newsletter at Sotheby's is that it's not like you buy one share of IBM, you could buy a thousand, they're all the same. Here, each work is unique, and each one has to be considered within its own context. You have to understand why one work is so much more valuable than another work. And it all has to do with quality. And quality is something that somebody with a honed eye, with years of experience, will be able to tell you. So if you look, I think it's important to look at the sites to see, but you have to keep in mind that the auction record is already very limited. You also have to keep in mind that the art market is totally unregulated. It's highly illiquid and it's very easily manipulated by a couple of important players. So with that in mind, you could, you know, take a look, of course, but always keep in the back of your mind, what is the quality of this work that I'm showing? Yes. Forgive my, my ignorance, but what's the difference between Impressionism and Post-Impressionism? They all look alike to me. Impressionist is uh, basically the effect of light on color and form the diffusion of light and the way it, it uh, impacts color and form. And post-impressionism, as a professor from Columbia said, is like impressionism on steroids. <laughs> so you have it's a lot bolder colors, a lot more important. There's, a, I have some post-impressionist works here, but impressionism tends to be a lot, uh, a lot, there's a lot of light and form seems to be diffused and uh, it's, it's, uh, it really, it, the flattening of the picture the surface as well. It's Monet, it's Renoir. This is very impressionistic. You see how the light seems to sort of uh, erase form. It's, it, there's a lot less solidity. That's what the impressionists are trying to see. Because what happened was that photography came into being at the turn of the 19th century. So paint, painters used to be able to paint portraits so that people could have a memory of their ancestors or their children. When photography came in, they, were, they, they didn't need painters to reproduce life as it was. It was no longer a window out on the world. So the artist decided, well, then we're going to really explore the art of painting. And the Impressionists came along and said, since we don't have to reproduce the real world the way it appears, we're going to interpret it according to the way we see how the, the effect of light on color and on form. And that gave birth afterwards to the Boast Impressionists, which were much bolder in color and high, more highly contrasted. And it's something that the most impression is there's some black lines around the objects. Is that the new That's design? snobby. That's snobby. That's already later. That so was uh, that's already a little bit. There are a lot of movements that were happening at the turn of the 20th century in quick succession, one after the other. But they were always influenced by the previous movement. So they take it one step further. And then there's a lot of in between. There are a lot, you know, that a lot of artists that fall in between two movements as well. No. Any other questions? There are a lot of works also by artists that are contemporary. People ask me about contemporary artists. I look at work by artists that I feel are of quality. I have a uh, work by an artist whose name is Alison Breyer, who worked with Wolf Khan, whom I like very much and I represent her. I have a young Iraqi artist that I discovered recently who studied with Isl an Islamic, uh, an Iranian calligrapher and I find the technique to be rather extraordinary. He was very influenced by the Iranian miniatures. So, you know, I only look for quality. I don't care if it was done in the 15th century, if it was done yesterday. If a work of art is good and it's got great quality, I, I, I will support it. So the question is not whether or not to buy contemporary or to buy impressionist. It's a question of finding good quality at affordable prices and this is really what I try to do in putting together the collection. And I try to have a little bit for everybody's tastes, but as you can see, I think the three light motifs that go through the collection are light, color, and intimacy. And a work of art has to resonate with you. You really have to fall in love with the work of art because it's something that keeps on giving to you over time. And uh, it's a passion. It really is a labor of love, but it's something that I enjoy doing and I, en I enjoy sharing my passion with others.